was that? Well, it's been a long road since the initial release of Graven into early access on Steam way back in 2021. Developed by Slipgate Ironworks and published by 3D Realms, it's basically what would happen if someone took influence from Hexen, Half-Life, and Deus Ex, and then threw it all into one bag, and yeah, that's really the best way to sum Graven up as a mixed bag. You had my curiosity, but now you have my attention. Because it really is one of the first big gaming disappointments I've had in 2024. And the reason for that is that this quite simply just feels like an unfinished game. And while it does have a lot of good ideas, it also has a lot of bad ones. Creating something that's as frustrating as it is rewarding to play. And while there is a large, dark fantasy world to explore here, which is fun, you're gonna have to put up with a whole heap of speed bumps along the way. Including in my case, one very big speed bump in the form of a soft lock that prevented me from even beating the game. All right, let's just stay calm here. Don't get all crazy on me. Right, so before I get too far into things, I do need to take a moment to thank this video sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership that delivers boxes of awesome. Top shelf goods from under the radar brands right to your doorstep. It's free to join and you can also skip a month or cancel it at any time. 90% of these products all come from small brands, many of which are based in the US, like Forge, an awesome Damascus steel knife made by Buck and Bear Knives located in Pennsylvania. Or Carnivore, a really cool barbecue rub made by the Great American Spice Co. in Rockford, Michigan. And every month they're adding all new products like outdoor gear, home and kitchen goods, clothing and even fresh seafood, all of which is based off a preference quiz. Each box has around 70 bucks worth of goods inside, which only costs you a fraction of the value. And you're able to preview each box before it's shipped, you know, in case you decide you don't want to keep it or even just skip that month, both at no extra charge. So to get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter the checkout code GmanLives20 or go to bespokepost.com forward slash GmanLives20. Story-wise, Graven does at least have an interesting premise. You're playing as a priest whose adopted daughter is killed in some kind of ritual. And after killing her attacker, you're then condemned on a charge that, yes, yeah, some people might call murder, but others would probably just call justifiable homicide. Either way, you evade capture and end up being ferried to the backwater town of Cruxfirth. More or less just kind of dropped into this world and left to fend for yourself to uncover the mystery as to what's afflicted the area. Don't forget your staff, priest. And look, I will say one thing in Graven's defense right off the bat, and that's that it definitely does look and sound the part. Running on the Unreal Engine 4, this is one seriously gorgeous game, and some very talented people have put a lot of effort into how it all looks and feels. The game starts off dropping you into this destitute village surrounded by swamps, and it effortlessly pulls off this grim and foreboding atmosphere. It's also packed with nice little details, like seeing a bunch of crows feeding on rotting corpses that scatter when you get near them. And then imagine my surprise when after six or seven hours where I was convinced the whole thing was coming to an end, it changes things up entirely and throws you into a frozen wasteland for the second chapter, before doing it again a few hours later for the third and final chapter set in an ancient city. And then even within each hub, there's often these massive tonal shifts, like in the second chapter for instance, which still keeps the whole dark fantasy premise intact, but then also has you moving through this abandoned estate that's got a bit of an outright steampunk vibe, with the whole place running on this kind of otherworldly form of electricity. It's kind of random too, but I really like the effect of how you can't see the ghosts in this game if you're staring directly at them. It kind of plays on that primal human fear of always thinking you see something out of the corner of your eye. Weapons sound punchy and impactful and blow up a bunch of enemies with an explosive barrel and your neighbours are probably going to want to file a noise complaint. I hope it's worth the noise. Even just the music helps to set the tone perfectly, capturing the hopelessness and the despair of these various civilizations destroyed by corruption and evil. And for a game that takes a lot of influence from Hexen, this stuff is eerily similar to all those various realms you'd explore in that game, where you saw the devastation the Serpent Rider caused on those worlds. The actual way the environments are laid out here too is kind of similar, with a whole Metroidvania vibe going on as well, where you're always dropped into a central hub. Then there's NPCs to interact with, items and weapon upgrades to purchase, before you then go off and slowly uncover your surroundings piece by piece. Finding new items, keys, and abilities, but then also shortcuts back to the hub area to minimize the amount of backtracking. Plus, I appreciate too how upgrading weapons actually updates the way they look in the game. 
Objectives are pretty varied. You'll be doing things like setting fire to a lighthouse to use as a makeshift distraction for all the nearby undead, or lighting up a bunch of beacons in the second chapter because apparently Gondor is calling for aid. And Rohan will answer. Muster the Rohirrim! The problem though is that it often isn't handled very well, and a lot of the time you'll frequently be wondering where the hell you're actually supposed to be going. And I feel like a lot of the complaints I have about Graven's direction, or the lack thereof, comes from the complete absence of a map. Which means you'll often be doing laps around an area for 15 to 20 minutes until you finally find where you're supposed to be going next. The first chapter isn't too bad I suppose, because there are quite a lot of notable landmarks that make it a little bit easier to get your bearings. But the third chapter is definitely the worst in that regard, and this city area you have to navigate just feels like the same copy-pasted buildings over and over. Half the time too, like I always start to think that I'd actually softlocked the game. And there was a few times when I was absolutely convinced that that's what had happened. Where I ended up having to basically imsim my way through these areas that I couldn't access. This is big brain time. By stacking props creatively and climbing up, which is something I highly doubt was intended. And yet it's kind of cool that the game allows that workaround because of the freedom of moving props and the autonomy of movement, but then it's also kind of stupid I had to do it in the first place, which is a direct result of how piss poor the game is at communicating where crucial areas of interest are. And I look at it this way, if the notion of spending 10 to 15 minutes stacking furniture to progress is preferable to spending another 15 minutes trying to find the way you're supposed to go, well, then that tells me the level design is seriously lacking. Now I don't know if the lack of a map is just the dev's way of referencing like FromSoft games or something, but I mean come on man, like even the most painfully elaborate games, you know like System Shock, which Graven I think probably takes some influence from, had a map. And even FromSoft eventually came around and added a map in when they made Elden Ring. Same thing too with Hexen, which is another game that had mastered the art of having you pick something up and flip a switch and have no idea what it did. But again, that game had the basic decency to include a fucking auto map. But the thing that completely boggles my mind here though is the inclusion of this tacked on stamina system. Now you've got two movement speeds here, you've got essentially a run and a sprint. But the sprint feels more like the kind of speed you'd expect in this sort of game. Whereas the basic run speed, it really does feel like playing an older shooter when you'd accidentally press caps lock. And look, having stamina might have been fine in any other game, but in these humongous environments where you're spending minutes getting from one side to the other, having to stop frequently to catch your breath is just soul sucking. It's even worse in the second chapter when you've got these fast zombie-like enemies that move insanely quickly. And if you've got no stamina, then you quite literally cannot get away from them. At one point, just out of interest, I even timed it, and it takes 20 seconds, 20 fucking seconds for your stamina bar to fill back up again. All right, let's just stay calm here! You can find all these shrines throughout the game which increase your max stamina, but I've got to be honest, I don't even think this makes much of a difference, because it still seems to run out in roughly the same amount of time. Despite Graven being tagged as an immersive sim on Steam, it also just kind of isn't. I mean, outside of maybe picking up and stacking boxes. So this whole stamina system just feels like it's been included for the sake of making the whole thing seem more complex than it actually is. Because aside from those minor mechanics, this really is just a pretty bog standard shooter. Enemies aren't super smart or all that hard to defeat. They're dumb as a bag of bricks, about as abundant, and they hit about as hard. So the difficulty really just comes from those random moments when you get hit with this incredibly damaging attack that knocks off like 90% of your health points in seconds. Let's see that in an instant replay. I mean, these guys aren't going to defeat you with their intelligence or advanced combat tactics, let's put it that way. Even when you come up against these giant enemies with shields and humongous swords, you might think that there'd be some kind of unique strategy to beat them. But nah man, you just kind of shoot them until they die. Even for the boss fights, there's not really any kind of creative strategy needed. And I found the best strategy for these was just to stay mobile, which means despite the visual spectacle of taking on these giant terrors, I may as well have just been fighting the cyber demon from Doom. Think about the only creative thing I noticed with the enemies was that if you knock a skeleton's head off, you can outright blind it. I Meaning it's just going to walk around completely clueless because it literally can't see a thing. 
The point I realized that this was just going to be a mindless shooter was during one bit early on in the first hub, when I was going around destroying all these totems to remove some kind of magical barrier. And the game just threw me into this giant opened up arena against a couple of dozen enemies, where all I could do was pretty much shoot them. And despite all the previous areas being full of explosive barrels, there was none of that kind of stuff here at all to play with. No traps or other hazards I could use to my advantage. Just this big opened up area for me to run around in while periodically backpedaling and shooting at whatever was approaching me from behind. And that right there sums up most of the combat, is just keeping enemies at arm's length and shooting at them, with there being little to no cohesion with the spells. But yeah, on the subject of magic, the way that the spells are handled is also kind of baffling, really only serving a utility purpose and really not being all that useful during combat. Now, fire is the first one you'll come across, handy for burning piles of corpses to stop enemies from spawning in, along with burning away blocked wooden barricades and pesky cobwebs that slow you down. Then in the second chapter, it becomes handy for melting away ice that's blocking your path. It does also seem to do damage to enemies, but it takes so long for them to die from this that I think it'd actually be more effective waiting for them to be killed by UV rays. The second one you'll find is the lightning spell, classic, which again is mostly used for puzzles. This time zapping the gears and cogs of machine panels to get something nearby moving, which is again, classic gameplay mechanic. And it is actually called Discharge in the game, by the way, but I'm not ever going to touch the possible your mum joke there with a 10 foot pole. Anyway, using this spell against enemies is going to stun them for a few seconds, which makes them easy pickings. And yeah, I guess that can be useful, but it's not like you ever really need to use it. Same thing with zapping enemies when they're walking through water. I mean, yeah, sure it looks cool, but it's not really that much more effective than just shooting them in the face. Finally, the last spell you come across is the Frost one, which, you guessed it, is used for puzzles. This time in conjunction with the Lightning spell on machinery to freeze gears in place. Along with turning water to ice so you can walk across it, which feels incredibly janky by the way, and is again something I don't think's ever actually needed to progress. This is probably the most boring spell of all when used against enemies too, because about all it seems to do here is slightly slow their movement and attack speed down. And how you're going to have a frost spell in a game like this and not let it turn your enemies into solid ice is just bewildering. I mean, let's compare this to the frost shards in Hexen, right? Where more or less every single enemy type in the game can be frozen and then subsequently shattered. Here though, about all it does is just make it look like they're moving in slow motion. Such a waste. And on the subject of wasted mechanics, we've got the kick, or the mighty foot as the game calls it, which is yet again just another completely overlooked feature. You ever heard of Dark Messiah of Might and Magic? Well, it was a similarly themed game where you had the most overpowered right foot in all the gaming. You could kick people off cliffs, into fire, or walls of spikes, placed randomly around the various combat arenas, and it was a fun, albeit broken mechanic. But if you were hoping to do any of that kind of stuff in Graven, you know, kick enemies off ledges or into the many barricades of wooden spikes you come across, well, think again, bitch. Because about all it seems to do outside of very low damage is just exist to be a bit of a reference to 3D Realms developer history. Because at this point, making blatant references to older titles is rapidly becoming about the only thing this game's got going for it. It just kind of seems like they came up with one or two ideas for each of these spells and never really developed it any further than that. And they're just something that I used every 20 to 30 minutes only when I had to for progression. You won't find much variety in any of the weapons either. Now the first one you get is your trusty staff, which is basic but surprisingly effective. Able to have multiple gems inserted into it throughout the game which affect how it performs. Like one gem's going to increase knockback when hitting enemies for instance, and then another one lets you destroy weakened walls, that kind of stuff. The first ranged weapon you get though is the Cuff Arrow, which is kind of like a mini crossbow worn on your character's arm that more or less functions like a pistol. It's useful enough and handy as a fallback, and later on you can even upgrade it so it uses mana with each shot for extra damage. 
but it also lacks a lot of feedback when shooting certain enemies, and the often complete lack of flinching makes it hard to tell if they're even taking damage. The ultimate fire mode for this is a completely useless zoom in feature, and I say it's useless because of how caked in dirt the scope is, making it near impossible to even see through. Can't see shit. Early on you'll also come across the sword, proving in this instance that the pen is indeed not mightier, because this thing makes a hell of a mess when swung around, able to hack down groups of weaker enemies really easily. However, after the first hub, I don't think I even ever used it again, mostly because the enemies just hit so hard from that point that getting in close was more or less suicide. You can also parry attacks if you time it right, but I found a far better strategy than trying to deflect blows was just to avoid them entirely, by just instead hanging back out of melee range and repeating the age-old tactic of shooting something until it dies. They even add in another melee weapon near the end of the second act with the flail, which is just so redundant by that point that I question why it's even included. Roughly halfway through the first hub, you'll find the Fletchant, which is a fancy name, I guess, for a crossbow shotgun. And I don't know if this is based off a real weapon, but all I found when I Google searched it was some really crude Pokemon fan art. Either way though, this thing right here, like any shotgun worth its salt, is going to be the workhorse weapon for most of the game. And I spent the vast majority of my time using it, if only too because ammo is so goddamn abundant. Also too because the ultimate fire mode launches out explosive projectiles that stick into enemies. And this by far I found to be the most useful attack in the entire game, killing certain enemy types in a single shot. And then also too, hidden away, kind of, in the first act is also the Peat Burner. Cool. Yeah, it is cool. Which for all intents and purposes is a rocket launcher with a delayed fuse. Because someone really thought that it was a good idea to make a worse off version of one of the genre's most seminal weapons. I mean, look, don't get me wrong, that delayed fuse is kind of okay for setting traps and all that, but I mean, a good old-fashioned impact explosion would have just been fine. Nothing else, though, there was actually some educational value in me finding this weapon, if only because I learned what peat actually is. Yeah, apparently, it's partially decayed organic matter, so I guess, in essence, you're literally flinging shit at your enemies. I do think hiding it away is kind of risky though, especially considering as far as I could tell, there's only one other instance in the entire game to find one. So if you miss this thing early on, well, then you're really up Pete Creek. But still, this weapon at least feels like it understood the assignment, and it sure does look and sound pretty when you make stuff go boom boom. In the second act, you'll come across the Burst Fire Crossbow. And yeah, another crossbow, because they're really taking a lot of creative liberties here with these ranged weapons. This thing, however, actually does pretty good damage, but for some reason, you don't get to manually reload it. Instead, it reloads itself after every few shots. Which means you either waste ammo on purpose so it's reloaded before your next encounter, or have it reload on you in the middle of combat when it's not ideal. Either way, though, something that could have easily been fixed with a simple inclusion of a reload button, which really doesn't seem like it's outside the realm of possibility, and again, that's trying to pass itself off as an immersive sim. Then there's the final ranged weapon in the second act, which is the Ballista, which is, you guessed it, another crossbow. And also, if this thing ain't a homage to the weapon of the exact same name from Daikatana, then I don't know what's real anymore. I mean, it's even centered in the screen and has a similar amount of kickback. In fact, I do want to say too that the whole second chapter gave me massive Daikatana vibes, with the notion of exploring this snowy medieval village, which, funnily enough, also centered around a plague. And then lastly, there were a couple other weapons I came across as well, both of which are magic-based, with the orthogonal hymnal and the knotted stave, and nothing else, they get points for sounding bizarre as fuck. Now, the hymnal really is just the Necronomicon from the Evil Dead series. It's a demonic-looking book with a face that absolutely burns through your mana supply without really much to show for it. And the Knotted Stave fires out weeds, I think, which do damage in a set area before dissipating after a second or so. Both of these, though, I didn't really find all that handy, and outside of using them out of curiosity when I first picked one up, I never really bothered again.
And one of the main reasons for that too is because Graven has this oddly imposed weapon limit. Now the way it works is you're forced to always carry your staff and spellbook in the first and second slot, leaving you with only a few limited slots left for the other weapons. However, the bigger and better weapons all use two if not three slots, so realistically you've only got space for two others along with maybe the cuff arrow. And it just doesn't really make any sense as to why this is so limited because whenever you bring up your inventory to swap a weapon over, the game pauses anyway, artificially stopping time and locking enemies in place around you until you decide what you want to do. And it would have made sense if opening your inventory didn't pause the world around you, like if it had more of an immersive purpose where you had to open up your backpack or your satchel in real time and really choose when and where to do it. But instead, you don't have any of that, which really just makes it a completely pointless mechanic. Again, giving the false impression of adding complexity when all it really does is waste my time. As a result, most of the time I'd just use the same one or two weapons until I ran out of ammo. Then I'd swap that one out for something else. But I think what pisses me off the most about Graven is that every time you quit out of the game, it throws you all the way back at the main hub for the chapter you're on. Some of these missions and areas you explore can take like a good hour or so to get through, which can be hard to backtrack through, especially if you end up taking an extended break and really forget what you were doing. The first time this happened to me was when I was maybe like 45 minutes into getting through one area, and then I had to take a bit of a break to go and make dinner for my kid and get him ready for bed. You know, typical attention-seeking toddler behavior. Oh, by the way, I was being sarcastic. Anyway, when I came back in a few hours later, I probably spent more or less that same amount of time just getting back to where I was first up to, having to navigate through that same area all over again and deal with all the same enemies. And this was bad enough when I quit out by choice. I mean, God forbid the game crashes. This also kind of ties into how the game is constantly auto-saving your progress, which I also dislike. Because this means if you play poorly, you know, burn through a bunch of your resources, you don't even get the basic benefit of being able to retry again from a previous checkpoint, because the game's already locked in your actions. And it's not like the kind of games that Graven takes influence from ever lets you create multiple save files, is it? Oh, by the way, I was being sarcastic. And because spare ammo and health can often be found inside all these destructible objects, this leads to these moments where you need to spend five minutes going around vandalizing everything to get those much needed pickups. <laughs> I smashed it good! Finally, there's all the random little glitches and bugs in there, minor things like ladders not working properly, and I also like the basic oversight of how opening treasure chests is often going to send the loot flying off a nearby ledge. I think for one enemy type in particular too, the animation for it isn't even working properly, and it just glides around in a static position. What the hell was that? There's a mini boss of sorts in the first chapter, which is this weird ghost type thing that haunts a library, and I have no idea if this thing was glitched out or I wasn't attacking it properly, but either way, I spent a good 20 minutes shooting it over and over to apparently no effect. Trying to figure out the strategy whilst also avoiding the dozen other enemies in the area is a whole other argument too. But it just got to the point where I avoided it and tried to get my business done before it could get me. Probably the worst one of all though is that I got softlocked in the third and final chapter and literally could not finish the game. Because after I finished one of the quests, the game didn't let me progress onward. I don't know, maybe that was a bit of a blessing in disguise though, because by this point I was about 15 hours in, and really felt like I'd spent 3 or 4 hours more than I really needed to. Time does seem to be standing still. Honestly, I don't know why Slipgate really felt they needed to try to make this super large scale, epic, grandiose game, but they've clearly had a bit of trouble here. The so-called end result we've got here with Graven is a testament to the fact that making games is hard. And look, maybe there is a good game in there, somewhere, and after a few more months of updates and fixes. But considering it's already been three years or so now in development, I don't think we should be expected to wait around any longer to find out. I'd say we've still got Wrath and Phantom Fury to look forward to, but now, I don't even know if that's the case. And it's a damn shame, man. It's a damn shame. You're gonna need it more than I.